You bet. All right, Hugh, can you hear me, sir? Hear me, you can hear, can you hear me now? I can, beautiful. Great. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. I've been checking out your websites and everything and talking with Phil and, and I'm kind of excited. This should be Good. fun. Good, thanks. Yeah, let's kick this off here. Uh, welcome to the Jess Heisel, looking forward. I am your host, Jess Heisel, and I am joined by Dr. Hugh McTavish tonight. And um, Dr. McTavish, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, uh, so I'm a, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a PhD biochemist, uh, and a patent attorney. Uh, and I started two pharmaceutical companies off my own inventions. Uh, and then I was, um, uh, then I started a, a nonprofit type called COVID Sanity and wrote a book titled COVID Lockdown Insanity in the last two years, uh, to document the, um, the harms of the, of the lockdowns, uh, and how those compare to the benefits of the lockdowns. Um, and uh, the harms vastly exceed the benefits is the bottom line. Um, and then uh, decided to run for governor of Minnesota. So I am I am running for governor of Minnesota uh, on the Independence Alliance Party, the successor to the Independence Party that Jesse Ventura won the governorship with. Uh, and um, yeah, so the, the um, the core issue that I that I hope we talk about is jury democracy, but also my opposition to the to the lockdown. So we can talk about various things. But anyway, that's that's why I'm running those two. Wait, I, I I saw your four pillars and the jury democracy. I have got a lot of questions. I I, I love that. I think that's genius. I, I I love the fact of getting people involved to be able to vote on stuff. Um, yeah. my, my 16 year old asked me about six seven months ago. He goes, Why do we need representation? when we have the people and the technology out there to actually get stuff done. And you are already a step ahead of that. You have this plan here, but I'm glad, I'm glad, he, I'm glad your 16 year old doesn't, didn't beat me to run it for governor. Yeah. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Might be a little bit of an age requirement there, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> he can take over mine, but so you, you started up this uh, governor campaign. Um, what, what brought you into that? Uh, it was, I mean, I started thinking about it really when the lockdown set two years yeah. ago, because I, I was, um, uh, frankly, I was thrown into depression by the lockdowns that closed, closed my church and closed my health club, which were basically, that was my entire social life was those two yeah. those three things. Um, and, uh, so I was outraged for myself. I was outraged for everybody else who was, um, uh, thrown into, depre into depression or kicked out of their job or lost their business, uh, and, or who's had, whose school was closed or told not to come to school anymore. Um, and, uh, so that kind of led me to want to start thinking about running for governor and, um, and then the jury democracy idea is actually an idea I had 30 years ago. And I always thought I would write a book about it. And then, and then with thinking about running for governor, really, because of the lockdowns, it kind of occurred to me, you know, Nobody reads books anymore. And uh, a much better way to promote this would be to run for office and that'll get it out into public debate and preferably win and actually implement it. And then it's really gonna be out there in public debate. And then I hope, um, um, yeah, I hope this idea spreads worldwide really uh, to every state and, and ultimately to uh, uh, the U.S. Constitution to, to change our system of government there and then I and worldwide. No, I, I love it. I love it. Yeah, I get more questions. But you're talking about writing books. So you're also an author and you've got a couple books out there that I'll, I'll mention here. But you've also authored, what, 18 scientific journals? Yeah, uh, 18 scientific journal articles. Wow. And, and I'm an inventor of 21 U.S. patents. Really? Yeah. Oh, of course, you're a patent attorney. I'm a patent attorney, so that helps. <laughs> that, that helps. So I, I that reduced the cost of getting them. So I did it myself. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, the, it, those are just those are just the ones I'm in, um, uh, the inventor on. Uh, so those were my own inventions. That was 21. Question totally unrelated to your campaign for a patent attorney: How long should patents be good for? Well, patents are good for 20 years from the um, 
filing date, filing for the application. Right. Uh, I think that's probably about right. Okay. Uh, it's actually the patent system. It's kind of an interesting question. We could talk about the patent system. Uh, um, and the copyrights. So we give way too much protection for copyrights. Um, the copyright term is now, oh, it may be 40 years, I don't even, not even sure. For the last, for the last 30 years, every time the copyright on Mickey Mouse was about to expire, the Disney Corporation oh, would go to the US Congress and ask that the term be extended. Yes. And the U.S. Congress would always comply. So every time, literally every time that was about to expire, they extended that co the copyrights for all things to keep protect the Mickey Mouse copyright. Uh, and it's now, I think, 40 years past the death of the author. Uh, um, so I think that should be probably a fixed term of maybe 40, 50 years or at the death of the author or five years after the death of the author or something. I mean, it'd be nice if the Beatles songs, for instance, were in the public domain now and anybody could do what they want with the Beatles songs. I, I would agree. Um, I would agree. I love the Beatles. So we're good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <that one? laughs> um, so, uh, so I think the copyright is too long. And then there's these weird quirks that, um, radio when 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 they pl play music on radio on the radio uh they owe a royalty to the songwriter they do not owe any royalty to the performers so and we are one of three countries in the world and i think the other two are cuba and north korea that do not give copyright protections to the performers on uh broadcast of music um, so that always struck, struck me as weird that the performers don't get a nickel off of, off of radio songs. I did not know that. Uh, it, uh, I would have thought performers would have been involved with it because of, well, they're performing it. Yes, they didn't write it, but maybe a percentage of it. Right. Yeah. But they don't, but they don't. I mean, in some cases, you know, James Taylor or whoever you're a singer songwriter, it kind of doesn't matter. You wrote the song and you're performing it. So you get the money either way. Yeah. But for a lot of people, you don't get the money either way. Right. <laughs> uh, so you, you had mentioned you, you started up two pharmaceutical com companies. Now, interesting, through my research, the one was for cold, uh, cold source, right? And the other one was for cancer. So please tell me about some of that. Yeah, that, so that's an interesting story. Uh, the cancer one, um, the, the cancer one was the first one. So shortly after, really a, almost immediately after I got out of law school and became a patent attorney, I contracted cancer. I had a PhD by, by, in biochemistry from a few years previously, but my research had not been on cancer. And then, um, uh, so then I get a out of law school and get cancer. So then all of a sudden I'm interested in cancer. So read journal articles on cancer and stuff and took an interest in what treatments I was going to get and came up with an idea for an improvement on the drugs I was getting. And being a patent attorney by this time, I wrote the patent application for it myself and started a company around it um, called IGF Oncology. And um, uh, and then eventually it took a long time, eventually raised some money, did the experiments in the lab that showed that it worked at the University of Minnesota. We, I had basically borrowed lab space from friends of mine who were professors. And um, and then got got big money from uh, a single angel investor in Arizona, in Arizona actually, uh, that allowed us to get get into clinical trials. And um, so anyway, that that company got started, and, and the drug seems to work. And then along the way, a few years later, um, as a patent attorney, an idea came across, or this compound came across my desk. Um, and it inspired an idea. The story is actually as the compound was used to treat warts, common warts. And I had frequent cold sores and I thought maybe this would work on my cold sores. Uh, and so I applied it to my cold sores and they did seem to stop. Uh, so it did seem to work. Uh, you tried this on yourself. I tested it on myself. We additionally had, additionally, 
And I was testing it, this compound on my, my, like it was applied topically. So I tested it on my skin, on my forearm to figure out the right dose. And one time I went to my poker group and my skin had turned black on my forearm from where I'd applied it because I over <laughs> overdosed a little bit. So they had a, they had a, they got a kick out of that. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so uh, yeah, invented that to treat my own my own disease and seemed to work on me. And then we've done clinical trials and it, it works generally clearly. Uh, I think. Um, so both those companies, the drugs are in the midst of clinical trials. We're trying to get FDA approval ultimately. That's awesome. And, and congratulations on pulling through on the cancer. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Minnesota and Wisconsin, of course, have our great researchers into that. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of good clinics, obviously. The Mayo, you're obviously familiar with that too. Yep. So, yeah, that's awesome. That's amazing. Um, you said 21 patents. Wow. Um, you had met, well, hold on. Independence and Alliance Party. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. So, uh, you know, obviously Democrats and Republicans, I, I know I'm tired of it. So let's just avoid that whole thing because people are very tired of it. But the Independence and Alliance Party. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm... I'm basically a liberal in most of my views, but I've but I'm a libertarian. I would say in rather have rather libertarian leanings. Um, I'm a strong environmentalist, um, and um, and then strongly against the lockdowns. So the the lo anti lockdown thing in particular puts me at odds with the Democratic Party, and most of my allies on that are. Republicans who voted for Trump, uh, which I did not do. And uh, so it makes for a strange situation. And it's, yeah. it's been, it's been fun in a good way, in, in a way, uh, it's kind of strained relationships some with my liberal friends. And I'm doing all these interviews with mostly conservative radio talk show hosts uh, uh, who oppose the lockdowns with me. And, you know, I like them and they like me. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's funny. It's funny that, that it's mixed these relationships up some, I think, but it makes me, um, uh, so my views aren't a good fit anymore for either party, really. Uh, uh, I disagree with both of the two parties on a lot of issues. And, um, uh, and I want to be above the fray also. And the jury democracy idea is in particular just, uh, in, in a nutshell, the idea is to um, take a random sample of randomly invite voters, about a thousand, a statistically valid sample of the entire population of registered voters in our state, which is about a thousand people, yeah. uh, have them come to St. Paul uh, and hear the arguments for and against a particular bill, like a, um, uh, um, like, like a jury in a civil or criminal trial. But in this case, instead of determining whether someone's guilty or innocent, they'll hear the arguments on whatever, raising the capital gains tax rate or, you know, whatever the right. proposal is. Um, <laughs> And uh, so with that, you know, we don't ask what the party affiliation of the people is. It's just we want to mix everybody together. And um, and I want to be um, kind of above the fray on that and nonpartisan. And so from that also, it helps, I think, to be with the Independence Party. I would agree. <clears throat> I would agree. It's amazing how people have come to be single voters, single issue voters. Yeah. And I've seen a lot with, with some of your touchy subjects, your abortions, your marijuana, your, well, in this case, what you're doing here, <clears throat> one of your pillars is about happiness. Mm -hmm. And, and I love that because you actually get into talking about unity and how to start bringing those people together. And um, so what do you do on that? So now you, you've got a book out there, if I'm not mistaken, a little bit about that, right? Uh, yeah. it, ending war in our lifetime. Oh, ending war in our lifetimes. So that wasn't really about happiness, but yeah. Okay, I, no, it, ending war. I do have a chapter in my current book on uh, COVID lockdown insanity. On the, the end of the, the end of the book asks the question: um, uh, What? Um, 
like to me, the one good thing that came out of the lock that comes out of lockdowns, I think the lockdowns have been a total disaster. Almost everything about it was negative, including the whole point of it was to save lives. That was the only potential benefit from this was it was going to save lives by preventing COVID deaths. Yeah. And um, it didn't save lives. It had the net effect of killing people because we drove people to suicides and drug overdose deaths. So I think there's really no doubt that certainly in the time of life lost, because the people we killed are so much younger than the people we were trying to save, that the balance is negative, that we killed, lost more time of life from the people we killed than we saved. And I think probably even in the number of people killed or saved, it's the balance is negative. That's an interesting perspective when you start looking long-term at the age range. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, so, um, so where was I going with this? So anyway, it was a total- <laughs> The unity and the happiness. <laughs> yeah, it was a total disaster. Uh, and, um, and to me, but the one good thing I think that came out of it is we showed that we could remake society on a dime. I mean, we ordered everybody to stay home. We closed the churches. We closed the restaurants. We 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 closed the health clubs and the bars and um, closed the schools. And everybody started wearing masks and every mostly willingly. And everybody started keeping a little more distance from each other and washing their hands more, mostly just willingly. Um, and so we were willing as a society to remake society on a dime. And um, so I think that's good news because that part is good news because we've, all, we've always been told, I think, by the press and the powers that be about whatever problem you, you are concerned about. Oh, it's nev never going to change. You know, Congress is for sale. You're, you're never going to change it. Um, uh, I love that comment. Congress is for sale. <laughs> <laughs> you should hear some of my other ones. We go into some of the stock trades and how they make their money. And I think it was $320 million they made just last year on stock trades. Oh, dude, is that right? I, uh, yeah, yeah. I think the fifth owned stock is Pfizer. And yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Follow uh, the money. Follow the money. But anyway, the, that, uh, the good news from this is people were willing to make sacrifices. We were able and willing to transform society on time. So I think it proves the lie of you can't do about anything about any problems and people would be unwilling to change their lives. People were willing to change their lives. Uh, so I kind of envisioned, well, so what if we put that purpose to good purposes uh, instead of this failed mistake of COVID, of the lockdowns? Um, and one of those, the key one, a key one would be um, uh, to pursue happiness instead of, you know, I, I've always felt the, the apparent goal of our government is to maximize GDP growth. That's, that seems to be the primary goal. And, and, um, and then with COVID, it was just bizarre to me because it was like, okay, now apparently the, the primary goal of government is to extend life for people living in nursing homes. I didn't even know we cared about people living in nursing homes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we do. We do. <laughs> well, we do, but I mean, the elderly have always said, you know, that we've got age discrimination and that they're kind of forgotten. We shunt them off into their nursing homes because the middle-aged people don't really want to see them or deal with them. And I always thought there was a lot of truth to that. And then, and, and then, um, so it was one of the bizarre things about the lockdowns. It seemed like, oh, now all of a sudden we're willing to make, we're willing to destroy the lives of children to try to get it four more years for somebody in a nursing home. Yeah. Um, uh, is, yeah, but anyway, so anyway, so I figure I've always generally, and I still kind of figure the primary goal of government is seems to be to maximize GDP and it should be happiness. That should be, that is the primary goal of our lives. Each of us as an individual, we want to make more money or we want other things, but the reason we want those things is we think it's going to make us happier. Um, what we ultimately really want is happiness. So, uh, so I think, so I imagine, well, what, uh, what if that was our goal uh, as a government and as a society to maximize happiness? And I uh, propose a couple of things towards that. Well, num first thing I say is do the opposite of everything we did in the lockdowns, because really the lockdowns couldn't have been designed more perfectly to minimize happiness. 
to, to, right. to create depression and minimize happiness. We are, a, we are a social species and we try to isolate everyone from, you know, it's like, yeah. it's like gorillas in a zoo. You, you got 20 gorillas in a zoo display and you decide, hey, let's just put them in 20 separate cages so they can't interact with each other. Well, what do you think is going to happen to the gorillas when you do that? Gotcha. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so um, well, there is a, there is the social point, and we saw mental health just crash. I think just here in Wisconsin, we had forty percent. It, it shot up. It almost doubled. We're at right around forty percent of mental health issues that we have, and now we don't have the mental health care either. So our you know professional mental health nurse practitioners, there's not enough of them around. We have counties, and I know Minnesota has the same problem. I've already Googled it, that they don't have the proper care to be able to support some of that mental health. So here we've created all these mental health issues, and now we don't have the support, and we can't create more mandates or any more lockdowns and expect it to get better. You are absolutely correct. Yeah, I think that's, I think we, you're right. I think we don't have enough mental health practitioners. Um, I've been disappointed also that the mental health practitioners we've got largely people became depressed because they, they weren't seeing people face to face basically. And they were longing for a face to face interaction with another human being. Yeah. So then they call for their mental health support and the therapists refuse to do in-person therapy. They do zoom therapy. So, so I kind of blame the therapists for that. I think they were overly in some cases they were, that was the policy of their organization that they worked for. They weren't allowing them to do in person. Right. Um, and, but in a lot of cases that was their choice, which mostly, you know, for anybody under age 60, even I'm not sure it did anybody any good to get the isolated anyway. I mean, the therapists didn't really protect themselves <laughs> that way, but anybody right. under age 60 and not in terrible health was at practically no risk of death from COVID. Correct. Yeah. Um, no, we're, we're, we're good there. You and I are on the same page. Um, I want to break into, let's break into some of your pillars here. Um, this jury democracy, um, I read it. I fell in love with it. And I love the fact that you can bring back votes for the people and almost empower the people again, right? You had mentioned in one of your speeches about Lincoln, by the people, for the people, we the, we the people. Yep. Love it. And, um, of course, I know the, the rule of 1,000. Right? How many M&Ms are in this jar? And you can take 1,000 polls and you're going to get pretty close to the average. You'll have some outliers, but yep. that's where you use so many people. And I love that. Um, so, so tell us a little bit more about the jury democracy. Like, how did you come up with this? You said 30 years ago? I came up with it, I think, when I was writing my first book 30 years ago, Ending War in Our Lifetime. And um, uh, so I always thought it would be my, my next book. Um, and, um, you know, anyway, I've got my jobs and stuff and sort of these companies. And so I was like, oh, I don't have time to, I'll, I'll write that book someday. And uh, <laughs> the last two years I realized, you know, um, you're only going to be alive another 20 years or so. If you're going to do everything you do anything about it, you better do it soon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, and then realized that the, I think the best way to do it, it's not a complicated idea. So the best way to do this is to run for run for office and try to get it out there in public debate. Um, but yeah, I, I like, I love you, you bringing the idea that the M&Ms or marbles in a jar, uh, that's, um, uh, I think it was James Sirwicky wrote a book titled The Wisdom of Crowds a number of years ago. And, yeah. and he uh, um, talks about that. I, I, if you do, if you have a giant jar of M&Ms or mar- marbles or something at, let's say, a state fair or whatever, and people come by and guess how many are in there, and, um, and, and you know, so you're going to give a prize to the person with the best guess. Um, if you have a thousand people or any large number of people guess, guess the number and then average all of their guesses, the average the odds are something like 50-50 that the average will be the the single best guess of the entire thousand. It's going to be in the top one or 2% of all guesses. Um, So, uh, and it's kind of the principle of nobody can beat the stock market. 
or it's very difficult to beat the stock market because the average of everybody's minds on evaluating the, the ver- value of the businesses is better than almost anybody can do on their own. Um, I mean, there's other things going on in the stock market too, but collectively we're all collectively we're smarter than anybody else. So I like to say one of my, I haven't really said it in public yet, I guess, but one of my lines on the campaign is going to be um, something along the lines of uh, I would be a great governor. I would be better than the guys I'm running against. I would be one of the best governors in, in Minnesota history, but the people as a whole will be a better governor than I could be individually. And, and I can, I feel like I can promise you if I'm elected, Minnesota will be the best governed state in the nation and the best governed territory in the world. Not because I'm smart or the best governor, but because we collectively as a people will be the best governors. Um, uh, Yeah. So the idea is to, um, um, get a thousand or so 500 to 2000 people 500 gives you a margin of error of about plus or minus four percent 2000 it gets down to about plus or minus two percent and a thousand is maybe plus or minus three percent um uh 500 somewhere in that range 500 to 2000 people let's say a thousand people bring them into st paul the state capital or potentially to a network of sites around the state uh, have them listen to the arguments for and against a particular bill or a particular proposal, and then break into groups of 12. After, after they've listened to the arguments, then um, actually probably first give them, set them down in a room with nothing else to do, take their phones away, tell them to spend their time, spend their time reading the bill until they're done with re- done reading the bill. So they'll have actually, they'll have actually read the bill which is better than many legislators or Congress people, which I, I don't mean as a slam on the legislators or Congress people, but they don't, they've got so many, so much work to do, so many bills to, that they really don't have time to read. They especially, don't. Yeah. They don't. Uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was at one of my um, representatives just in our area, and they were asking him about one of the bills that he sponsored. And he goes, I'm not familiar with that one. And I brought it up on my phone. I said, you were the, you were the co-author. Uh, <laughs> never read it never wow read it. wow yeah so have them read the bill listen yep. to the arguments for and against then read the bill then break into groups of 12 and and have the chance to discuss it with the other 11 people in your panel and try to convince argue with them for your viewpoint which one consequence of having people break up like break into groups like that i think is if if one side or the other tends to be jerks about it, <laughs> they're going to drive people away and they're going to lose votes. If, if you're polite and respectful, you're, you're, you may gain a, a vote or two. Yes. Um, uh, and, um, and then have a secret vote. Uh, I think it should be secret. You could argue it should be open, but um, I think it should be a secret ballot vote then of the entire thousand. And, um, you know, with majority prevails. I'd actually make it not, 51% prevails, but in order to change the status quo, to enact a new new law or approve a new mine or any change to the status quo would require 55%. So that would be outside, a little bit, outs- at least a little bit outside the margin of error. Uh, so you guaranteed the reality is a majority and preferably and probably 55%. So probably actually a fairly decent consensus for that position. And, and one of the things I really liked about this is you're going to get multi, like a whole plethora of different type of people. So you're going to have all these, you know, you're, you're poor, you're black, you're white, you're Hispanic, every type of nationality, every type of gender, every, everything's in there for this vote. Yes. So that eclectic view. Yeah, really eclectic and, and, um, yeah, so not only by ethnicity or gender, the way people generally identify themselves, but also by political outlook and by life experience and just every which way imaginable, bearded versus non-bearded men. <laughs> <laughs> we'll I have not heard that one. That's new. I like that. <laughs> uh, um, and, um, and the young in particular. I mean, the young 
for Congress, you know, basically nobody's under age 35, 30 anyway, uh, and it tends to be quite old. Uh, and for state legislators, I think uh, tend to be younger than that, but still biased quite a bit to the elderly or older, older population. So people, so the young will have some representation and, uh, um, and be able to have some some vote voting or voting power proportional to their numbers and poor and the uh, poor and middle class. Uh, I mean, I, studies have shown that Congress Congress um, gives a lot of deference. The top one percent or 0.1 percent of the income ladder get what they want quite a bit from Congress. The top 10, 20 percent get what they want less often than the top 1%, but a fair bit. Congress cares what they think. The bottom 50%, Congress cares literally nothing about what they think. Um, yeah. uh, so here, the bottom 50% will be 50% of the voters, 50% of the power. The 99%, as the Occupy Wall Street talked about, the 99% of us, meaning the body, bottom 99% of the economic ladder, will have 99% of the power. <laughs> um, That's what I love. Because <laughs> it's bringing it back for the people. Yep. I mean, when we have a 44,000-page tax code bill in our legislation, and you can give the power now back to that lower class to start making it right, ooh, that shifts, doesn't it? It really does. Also, you mentioned the 44,000-page I mean, I think as a sponsor or an author of a bill, you got a lot better chance of getting that bill passed if it's language that people can understand. Yes. 10 or 20, <laughs> pages, 20 pages than if it's 44,000 pages and right. it's in legal gibberish, gibberish that nobody can understand. Correct. Uh, so it will, in the long run or fairly short term, probably lead to simplifying and making the law more accessible, uh, I think. I think it'll help clean up loopholes. Yeah. Yes, very much so. You had said on your jury democracy on your website, if the jury approves the bill, I will sign it into law. If it rejects the bill, I will veto it. Effectively, I will not be the governor. We all will be. I will give the power to you. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's... Again, the, we'll be the best governed state in the nation because we'll have the best governors in the nation, everybody collectively. Um, you, you were asked a question. I, I want to ask this out because it was a good question. Um, mandates. So you are against mandates. So let's say you get this committee of, of 2,000 people in there for a big another lockdown that wants to happen. And somebody says, hey, let's vote on mandates again across the state. But the committee now comes up and says it's 55%. Would you pass it or would you veto it? Being that your personal views and maybe some other people, and maybe oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'd, um, uh, no, I, 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 if the if the jury says go back into lockdowns, I, I'd sign that for sure. Okay. Uh, I'd go along with that. I said in my campaign, in my campaign introduction, um, uh, my mines near the Boundary Waters that I would sign that one. That's actually a closer call. I may be, may want to retract that one at some point in the campaign <laughs> because it's, uh, um, I'm very confident they would reject the mines. As, uh, but if they didn't, that'd be, um, I don't know, you know, I, I, I don't want to, the problem is that's an irreversible uh, that's the damage would be irreversible. Uh, and I just so, picked that one because it was strong about it. And you have some other things out there. So I just wanted to see the other side. Yeah, but the, but the jury, to, but the, uh, sorry, the lockdowns. Um, yes, I'd have no problem uh, signing. A, if the jury says, let's go back into lockdowns, I'd have no problem signing that. Uh, I also think there's no chance really that they would do that. Uh, no. Um, no. But, I think after two years, I think people have given up on that yeah, they, yeah, I think they figured it out by now. Yeah. Well, and it's and interesting. The, but, yeah, and if you know, I, there's just no advantage. Like I said, the, the data is pretty clear that it's caused more loss of life from the people we killed, and we did the lockdowns did kill people than um, it saved in prevented COVID deaths. So, in addition to the lost education, the lost schooling, the lost money, the lost jobs, the lost small businesses. 
the depression, the huge increase in depression and unhappiness yeah. and the lost freedom. There's just, there's literally no advantages to right. lockdowns. They, they have, yeah. 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 So one of the things that you've been a, a very influential, uh, well, not supporter, but um, speaking out against uh, with COVID lockdown insanity. Now you have COVID, was it COVID-sanity.org? COVID-sanity.org is the nonprofit I started and then I wrote the book uh, and started blogging about it and, and then wrote the book COVID Sanity. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Sorry, sorry like, COVID Lockdown. COVID Lockdown Insanity. No, like, the, book is, the book is COVID Lockdown Insanity. The nonprofit is COVIDSanity.org. Um, well, during this whole time, did you have a lot, did you have censorship that was happening to you or anything? Oh or? yeah, you saw that in my, yes, no, that was an, that was a, um, Boy, that was an eye opener to me. I would not have, uh, but anyway, yes, we were censored. We we tried to run ads on Facebook and Google, really just presenting CDC data and about how much depression there was caused, was caused basically, and how that compares yeah. to the, um, I thought a generous, to an estimate of how many COVID deaths we might be preventing or how much time of life saved. Um, and so I had the estimate that maybe we're saving six, 200,000, preventing 200,000 COVID deaths. We had about 600,000 in the U.S. COVID deaths by the time the vaccine was widely available. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so I thought a generous estimate was maybe we've prevented 200,000 COVID deaths. And anyway, compared that and the time of life saved, if that was the number, to the time of life lost from the deaths of excess depression, excess suicides and so on. And to the depression, the depression, to me, the depression was the worst outcome of, uh, of the lockdowns. We went, the U.S., to start with, the U.S. was at 8.5% of the population in moderate to severe depression in our, is our baseline in 2019, which is pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, and we managed to triple that. That went to 27, over 27% of the U.S. population went into clinical depression, moderate to severe, major depression. Wait, so we went from 8.35 to 27. 8.7, I think, to over 27. So it's a 19, we threw 19.3% of the U.S. population. We threw basically one in five Americans in, into major depression by the lockdowns. Holy crap. And we don't have the care to be able to take care of that. Yeah. So... If you so the insight I had was how do you compare? So we three if we save two hundred thousand lives, we threw three hundred and sixteen people I think was the number into depression for every one COVID death prevented. Uh, so seems pretty obvious to me that's a bad choice, bad trade off. But how do you compare being depressed to death? Um, and I think what an insight I had is you can compare it by time uh, as time of life lost. So when we're all going to die, that's one of the things that I think has been kind of overlooked in this. We act like if we can save the life of someone in a nursing home from death by COVID, they'll never die. <laughs> uh, or anybody. We're all going to die, regardless of our age. Um, it's just how much time we've got left. Um, and so I calculate that the average amount of time left for the COVID dead, had they not contracted COVID, is four years. So if we prevent a COVID death, it's four years of life expect, life saved, uh, four person years of life saved. Uh, but my insight was the depression can be considered lost time of life too. Uh, if you believe you're never going to get out of your depression, you're very likely to kill yourself. You're very likely to prefer to be dead. Uh, and um, so if you're depressed for five months, which is the average time of depression, you can consider that five months of life lost. So if you consider that time of life lost, it's more than 30 times the time of life saved from preventing, from preventing 200,000 COVID deaths. Um, uh, so anyway, that was, uh, now I don't remember, I got off on this. I don't remember what <laughs> answering to start I do with. that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. I it, from from somebody that I had a lot of mandates against myself with my uh, job, and it, for five months I kept getting the emails, "You're going to get fired." It does. It does change somebody's perspective. It's it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the censorship. Sorry, you were asking about censorship. Censorship. There there you go. Censorship. So statistics like that: depression versus time of life lost, and deaths versus time of life lost. We were just distributing 
facts on that, mostly CDC numbers, refereed scientific journal article numbers on the amount of um, depression, the amount of suicides and drug overdose deaths we were seeing or were likely to see. Yeah. And um, uh, and I tried to post place ads with Facebook, with Google, with the Minneapolis Star Tribune newspaper, with um, a consortium of liberal and conservative political websites. All four of those entities refused our ads. Um, they wouldn't even take our money to distribute CDC facts if it was contrary to the pro-lockdown viewpoint. Um, so that was really an eye-opener to me. I did not believe that that level of censorship existed in the United States. Um, and uh, how, wait, So for those first predictions and all the things that you started to um, um, say at the beginning, how, what was the reality? Let's say when you said at the beginning, two years later, how close were you to some of those predictions? I think I was pretty close. I was uh, I a little underestimated the harms and overestimated the COVID deaths prevented. Uh, so the balance is even worse than I said it would be. Yeah. Um, the there's no really there's no evidence that lockdowns it's kind of shocking it's a surprise even to me but there's no evidence lockdowns prevented any COVID deaths at all and a review recently came to that conclusion that it was prevented reduced COVID deaths by 0.7 percent or something yeah uh, um, and that was my conclusion if you look at a chart of uh, um, a chart of deaths or cases versus time. And then you put an arrow in that of when we imposed stay at home orders or when we imposed mask mandates, and then another arrow when those are lifted. So if those did some good, the trends should start to come down when they're imposed, when they're lifted, the trend should bump back up. You don't see that it, it, for any jurisdiction anywhere in the world. It just keeps going on its merry way, uh, whichever direction it was going. Like you'd have no idea when these came on and off. Everybody the, still needs food. We got to get out and get to the grocery store and everything else. And you still yep, got to enjoy yep. it. So, yeah. yep. hey, um, I want to break into, if you don't mind, I'm so sorry, but I want to break into you're protecting the environment. Okay. Um, I, 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 I love this portion. Um, do you know anything about a book, Wild Plants of Minnesota and St. Paul area? <laughs> yeah, I wrote that book. I it was uh, I haven't got it for sale, I'm, but I made a few errors in the species. So I'm working yeah. with somebody to correct, to get a new edition out and then hope to have that for so sale. So as a biochemist, how did you get into that? Oh, I've all, it's been, kind of been a hobby of mine to identify plants most of my life. And, uh, and, I, um, and I have the bad, um, uh, anyway, I keep going out, bringing the Save and Guide books. And I, I know I've identified this plant 10 times before, yeah. and I don't remember what it is. So I'm breaking up the same guidebook, going through the same process to identify it again. Um, and so I kind of thought, if I write my own book, I'll learn them better. <laughs> and, and also anyway, so that, that's, that was basically the motivation for doing it. I was just trying to find the app. Oh, I got, I downloaded picture of this on my phone. And oh I, yeah. Yeah. I don't use those apps. It's yeah. cheating to me. So I'm sorry. Those apps are out there, but <laughs> well, it was funny. I got it. And then we were out hiking with the wife and kids and I went to try to use it. And guess what? There's no signal. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Kind of doesn't do you any good when you're out hiking and there's no signal. But, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, I had that one. Um, so I, I like this. So what other type of things are you doing for, or are you looking at? So you were talking about the copper and nickel mining in Minnesota. Tell me about that. Oh, um, so there's a proposal to uh, do copper nickel mining in a couple of different mines. Uh, one that would drain the water where they're doing it would drain into, into the boundary waters. You could, contaminates the, the, the groundwater yeah. and, and the other, um, the water would drain into Lake Superior if they contaminate the groundwater. Um, and um, so I oppose both of those uh, mines. The problem with copper nickel mining is uh, Rio Tinto is a corporation. They, they've got mines around the world and some, many of them have leaked that. They, they, so they produce you have to use sulfuric acid to extract the metals from the ore. So they, they yeah. pump sulfuric acid into the, into the ore that they mine. And then they have to put that into a dam 
once it's processed, then they've got to store that somehow. So they put it in a great tailings ponds, um, man-made ponds and keep the metal laden, sulfuric acid laden and contaminated with toxic metals um, in these ponds. And the ponds then have to last forever. <laughs> um, and we're not going to be around forever. So I think it's a pretty safe bet. Eventually, those are going to leak, if not in the first 20, 100 years, certainly at some point. Yeah. Oh, they will. Um, of course. Um, they will. Yeah. Um, in a land of a thousand lakes, they're going to flood, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Question. And contaminate our lakes. So I pose, I pose that. Yeah. With sulfuric acid, won't you, if you mix it with water, doesn't it create hydrochloric acid? Uh, no, no. If no, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, well, sulfuric is more acidic than hydrochloric. If you mix it with salt water, if it mix it with salt water, you got the, when you dissolve sulfuric acid or any salt or any acid or base, um, it breaks down and just it's dissolved in the water. So you've got acid, which is proton, H plus ions, and yep. you've got sulfate. Uh, when you dissolve sulfuric acid, they're no longer connected to each other. They're okay. basically a separate compound once they're dissolved. And if you did it in salt water, in salt water, you got sodium ions, you got chloride ions running around. You add sulfuric acid to that, you just add proton, uh, H plus ions and sulfuric ions around. You couldn't, yeah. so then you're right. At that point, you've got sulfuric or hydrochloric acid in effect instead of sulfuric acid. Yeah. And none of that's going to be anywhere close for the good for the environment. It'll just yeah. destroy everything. Kill all the fish. Yeah. Plants. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, the, the, the acid eventually gets, um, well, kill, kill all the French fish and, and plants. Eventually, I guess they come back and the acid winds up out in the oceans and gets diluted. But the, the, toxic, yeah. the toxic metals are kind of the bigger problem. Is this in a worst case scenario, like it could get into the pond or definitely it will get into these ponds? Oh, these ponds are going to be nothing but toxic metals on sulfuric acid. So uh, why would why would it be allowed? That's what I'm really confused about. So I, I know well, it provides yeah. jobs. I mean, it'd be mines. So it provides jobs for the life yeah. of these mines, which might be 40 years. Um, to me, that's not worth it. So that's, I don't remember what exactly the job estimates are, 200, 400 jobs maybe for 40 years. Um, and so a lot of people want those jobs. Um, and um, so that's that's basically the, the argument for it, as I understand it. Also, um, and, you know, just it'd be another business, a bit, relatively big business in northern Minnesota, which could use more business and more economic opportunities and more jobs. Um, Copper and nickel prices are through the roof right now. Yeah, that did be profitable. <laughs> that be profitable, and we need we need copper and we need nickel in the world. So the argument is made: well, you're selfish because you don't want it in your backyard. We got to get the copper and the nickel from somewhere. Uh, and um, but yeah, I don't want it in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. I, I I would fight it as a mechanical engineer. I know that there's solutions out there to do some of this stuff. So there's a filtrations, you know, you can, it costs money though. That's, that's what they don't like. If okay. they know there's some of that out, um, it costs them money. So it cuts into their overhead. So they're not going to make as much money off the copper. Nickel. Um, yeah, if you, if you had a way to do it, that did not result in, in ponds that are supposed to last forever. Yeah. Um, if you could actually clean up the waste and dispose of it properly. And so we don't have to worry about the pond dam breaking. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I, we could think about it. We could talk about it. Yeah. So, what are type of uh, protecting the environment uh, ideas you have out there? What do you support? Um, kind of almost anything you could propose. I'm on the environmental <laughs> side of it. Uh, um, Solar, wind, biomass. Yeah, hydroelectric. Oh, yeah, hydroelectric. Um, uh, but also, population is one of my big concerns. So we are not only for protecting the environment, but also our economic well-being and um, our uh, um, the equality of society, uh, income inequality and wealth inequality. Uh, so all of those things, we can become poorer, we become more unequal when we become more overpopulated. And the environment, of course, gets breaks down. And uh, so 
and in my view, we are we're way overpopulated. There's an optimal. There's such a thing as an optimal population for human beings, just like there is for deer or rabbits or any other species in its environment, uh, where we can where the environment can process our wastes, where where we've got adequate resources uh, for ourselves economically, um, where we're where we've got the can grow the trees fast enough to supply our paper and wood needs uh, and still have forests left over uh, and old virgin forests and so on. Um, so there is such a thing as an optimum population and we're above the optimum population. So I think overpopulation is an issue. Um, uh, and just um, uh, giving some land back to other species, we basically use all arable land on the planet for human beings for our own use. There is in the Midwest, uh, for instance, Minnesota and Wisconsin, we had a lot of virgin prairie uh, when the settlers got here, which made for fantastic soil. We've got, I think about, I think less than one percent of the native prairie still exists. The rest of it's been turned to the plow. Um, so we are in effect a psychopathic billionaire that has 99% of the wealth in the world, that occupies 99% of the space in the world. And if anybody su suggests that some of, that it should give some of that space to others, to other species for their use, whines, you know, anybody suggests that billionaire pay any taxes or give anything to, anything to charity, whines about it. <laughs> uh, so I'm suggesting we give some of that land back to other species. Uh, uh, a lot of it, and you know, my dream is we've is we eventually have wolves and buffalo roaming their entire previous range, which for wolves is the entire 48 states, for buffalo is the entire, you know, from Montana to Wisconsin and from Arizona to Texas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Earth Day was kind of started on a little bit of that principle, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, kind of pretty far. To, to that other side, but Earth Day was about the same thing. Uh, yeah, Earth Day was about the same thing and started by Gaylord Nelson from Wisconsin. Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> Universal Wisconsin guy. Yeah. You bet. Yeah, there was a couple of them in there. Uh, Gaylord is one. Um, oh, and I should know this. Yeah, I shouldn't. He's the name that I know of. I he probably wasn't the sole founder of Earth Day. I don't know who the other founders were, but he was one of the founders. I work at the University of Wisconsin. They get a couple of buildings named after them too, and I can't yeah. remember them right now. So I'm in really good trouble. So, oh, that's so. cool. I'm glad they've got I'm glad they got buildings named after him. They've got um, uh, one of the buildings at the University of Minnesota is named after Norman Borlaug, uh, who's um, the father they credit as the father of uh, the Green Revolution. Um, uh, uh, the using. The, the increase in food output per acre that we've had since the 1960s, which is basically due to fertilizer and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. irrigation. But um, anyway. Is there anything that Minnesota can do to capitalize on that? So, you know, we have an overpopulation. Um, is there anything that Minnesota can start putting in for maybe industries or anything like that to start helping with jobs, to start building that up? Building what up? What do you mean? Um, let, let's say that you, we are, um, we're overpopulated. Uh -huh. and what things can maybe Minnesota do to uh, potentially get jobs to help out with that maybe food famine type situations? Oh, oh, um, I don't know. I don't know that I think about it that way. But uh, um, I mean, we are we're certainly doing our part with the farms in this state to produce okay. food for the world, yes, uh, right. <laughs> uh, and the agriculture industry in Minnesota, which is probably our biggest industry, I guess. I, I, I Maybe medical devices up there. I don't know, but I suspect agriculture is bigger. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't know that we need to change anything from what we're doing uh, uh, as far as feeding the world. Yeah, we're doing, we're trying to do our part in Wisconsin too. So don't worry. Yeah. yeah. We're doing about $88 billion just in our dairy industry. So Whatever we can do to export over to you, you betcha. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, we enjoy your cheese, although we are pretty good at making cheese too. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, is there any other uh, issues that are important to you? Like, um, I, I see your pillars, but is there any other um, ranked choice voting or um, 
Oh, yeah. Ranked choice voting is important to me uh, and proportional representation. Proportional representation gets kind of less important once you've got jury democracy because it's perfect proportional representation. Uh, but um, I think ranked choice voting is a great idea. Um, uh, I would use it incidentally on the jury, I think maybe probably to determine the state budget. Uh, we would have potentially just the Republicans and Democrats submit their two, each one budget and the jury picks between the two of them for Ooh, the budget of the state. I would, but I would probably say, let's have four or five budgets. So kind of the left wing, the moderate Democrats, the right wing, the moderate Republicans, whatever, whoever can put together the top four or five vote getting budgets out of the, out of the, uh, uh, um, out of the legislature, maybe the governor, if, I, if I'm governor, I get to submit one. And um, and then let the jury pick between those four or five, which I would do by ranked choice voting um, and maybe winnow it down to two and then have them just pick between those two. Um, uh, so um, yeah, I anyway, ranked choice voting is a great idea. I love this middle of the road type approach that you're taking. Oh, I, thank I, I love that. Um, it's it's bringing it back for the people. Yeah, yeah, it's bringing it back to the people, yeah. And yeah. on the budget idea, I, I, I'm not so sure that the top vote-getting budget is going to be the one in the middle of the road. It may be one of the extreme budgets is could the be. one in the <laughs> It very well could be. Yeah. <laughs> even with ranked choice voting, though, it's kind of nice because even, you know, your one, two, three choices, you know, two could potentially end up winning, so... Yeah, yeah. That makes it nice. Yeah. You bet. Um, last minute, any other big issues? Well, so the the, the happiness, my one of my proposals for happiness. So uh, I've got two proposals for happiness that are kind of innovative. One was invented by Kramer on Seinfeld, is mandatory name tag. So replace the, the mask mandate with a name tag mandate. Uh, um, and the state, I, I'd have the, I'm kind of serious about this. I am serious about it. It wouldn't really mandate it. We wouldn't find people for not wearing that, wearing their name tag or anything, but, um, but maybe officially make it mandatory with a penny or no, no fine. Uh, and, um, and manufacture the name tags on demand for, for Minnesotans and, and send them out to people. Uh, that say that say on it. In addition to your name, your first name, presumably, uh, or your full name if you want to do your full name, uh, it says Minnesota nice. So a reminder to us, which is one of the kind of the slogans of the state, as you know, that Minnesota, Minnesota nice. And people say, well, we're not really nice. It should be Minnesota ice, or we're kind of cold to strangers or whatever. But I don't know. Anyway, I think it's a reality. I think Minnesotans are nice. And a reminder to be nice to each other and, and a reminder of our humanity. So I think that really will would make us a bit happier. Uh, wouldn't turn things overnight, but I think it would make it easier to meet people and make friends and, and just connect us to each other and, and make us a bit happier. Uh, and the other proposal is um, uh, walks, mandatory mandatory to go outside for a walk for 15 minutes, sometime between <laughs> two and three o'clock every Thursday. And businesses have to give their workers a time off to go for a walk at that point. And so you're need, so everybody's out walking at the same time. You get a little walk, walking, which is just about the best exercise you can get. And everybody, so everybody can, almost everybody can do that. And it would be good for them to get outside and get a little exercise. And since everybody's doing it at the same time, you can meet your neighbors and 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 talk. You got to name people. tags. Uh, and you got you, name tags. Yeah. Are you going to mandate this in or make it mandatory? Sorry, I would use the word mandate. Uh, are you going to make this mandatory in January and February? Uh, I'm expecting I'm expecting the turnout to be a lot lower, but yeah, I'd probably make probably it right. yeah. <laughs> we're about the same latitude, so I totally understand. So yeah. Yeah. So where can people go to find out more information about you? My website is McTavish for the number four MN.org. Uh, I assume if you Google McTavish for governor, uh, um, you can find my website, I hope, but I actually haven't. Uh, you can. That. Yeah. You, you can. I might have done it. Okay. Um, <laughs> M-C-T-A-V-I-S-H. That's correct. Dr. Thank Hugh you. McTavish. I bet you. And then is there social media is that your um, uh, so social media tags are generally Mc, at McTav at uh, McTavish number, number four MN. Uh, um, 
And uh, on TikTok, I, there's Hume, it's Hugh McTavish because I was already a TikTok star. So we're sticking with that. Um, a TikTok uh, star. Awesome. Yeah. I'm over to, I have not looked at that. I will okay. check that out. That, that was where I had gotten the most traction was TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, uh, with, with Independence and Alliance Party, uh, is there things on that that you guys got some events coming up or anything? Um, gee, I, I'm not, not that I'm aware of actually, we, maybe we do. Are you, are you aware of something that I'm not I'm aware not. of? Okay. <laughs> I'm not. I'm uh, betting you're going to be pretty busy this summer. Like what, are you going to be hitting out, uh, county fairs and things like yeah, that? Yeah, I'll be, I'm planning on hitting out, hitting out to county fairs. Uh, I want to try to reach out to the colleges and universities in Minnesota and hopefully give some talks there this yeah. spring before the end of the school year. Um, and uh, yeah, go to the county fairs. Uh, I'm sure I'll be spending a lot of time at county fairs from this summer. I want to get around the entire state. And, and like a champ. And um, and the state fair, I'm not a big fan. I'm kind of an introvert, so I don't like crowds. So I've never been a big fan of the state fair. You'll but I it. guess this year I'm going to be living there for two weeks. I bet you will be. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on, uh, Dr. Hugh McTavish. I truly, truly appreciate it. Wish you the best of luck over there. Um, thank you, Jess. Anything you need me. over there, um, keep me posted. I'm, I'm your neighbor, so I'll try to help how I can. Thank you very much, Jess. Thanks for having me on. You betcha. You take care, sir. See you. Bye.